mode. Hello, hello, my dear friends. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's Thursday, it's 11 o'clock in the morning, and we are live. Welcome to another one of our great webinar series, The Long and the Short of It, by Clive Lambert, Darren Sinden, with a little help from me, your humble servant, Mikhail Onohov. I'm obligated to let you know, guys, that trading effects and CFDs using leverage may result in the loss of all your deposits. Trading losses can also exceed all of your deposit, but since you're trading with other markets, we thought of that and we have negative balance protection in place. As always, I'm Mikhail, Client Relationship Manager at Admiral Markets. If you're looking to open a demo account, a live account, or just want to discuss something interesting, get in touch. I will be very happy to get a new Forex acquaintance. You can uh, get in touch with me via email, on the phone, and you can also, also add me as a connection on LinkedIn. Today, I have a special treat for all of you. As you know, Admiral Markets UK takes education extremely seriously. During the last webinar, Clive gave away a free trial to his services, and I thought to myself, wow, what a great strategy. Since generosity always goes a long way, I decided, decided to do something very similar. Since my services of a client relationship manager are already free of charge for all of my clients, I decided to give away our great ebooks absolutely 100% free of charge. If you're looking for a good read, get in touch with me and I will make sure you receive a great introducing ebook on Forex instantaneously to your email. Write me an email to mo.betalmarkets.com and I will make sure a new ebook is in your inbox in a matter of minutes. But now, I'm extremely happy to pass the floor to Mr. Darren Sinden who will take on with this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Misha, uh, for that introduction. And welcome to the sixth of our webinars uh, entitled The Long and the Short of It with myself, Darren Sinden, and my colleague and co-presenter, Clive Lambert. Um, and let's, uh, and let's crack on where we would normally start. Uh, here we go. Mood of the markets. Well, it's been a very interesting week and it promises to be uh, equally so today with a, with a ton of economic data coming up in the States and plenty of US earnings this afternoon as well. But of course, the big news uh, came last night when the Fed announced it was definitely ending QE3. Uh, so the mood of the markets now is anticipatory, if you will. Uh, the Fed is shifting its focus to its first interest rate rise after ending an era of unprecedented asset purchases, and we'll look at that, at the scale of that, a little later on. In a marked change of language, the rate setting FOMC highlighted an improvement in the US labor market, dropping its previous views that there was significant underutilization of labor resources. It said instead that this was gradually diminishing. And this signals a big shift in the Fed's horizons away from aggressive monetary stimulus via its third round of asset purchases, or QE as we know it, and towards the end, or the, towards the need rather, for an eventual rise in interest rates from their current level of close to zero. Um, that from uh, the FT Alphaville blog this morning. Um, and of course, the net result of the Fed uh, changing its language, you remember these Fed statements are poured over by, by people um, looking for the slightest hint of a change of, of, uh, of stance, uh, is that the dollar has strengthened across the board. Uh, markets anticipating a rate rise in the states, and as we know, um, higher interest rates attract money into currencies, and so the dollar strengthens as QE ends, and the, the, uh, the market looks for uh, a, an, an initial rate rise in the states, but still probably that isn't going to come until some way through 2015. So. Let's have a look at what else has been going on this week. Well, it's been, there's been quite a few things um, happening since we last spoke on Tuesday. Uh, first of all, we had uh, some, some comments from the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. They commented on the valuation of the New Zealand dollar and said the following, lower commodity prices and increased global financial market volatility have taken some pressure 
off of the New Zealand dollar. However, its current level remains unjustified and unsustainable and continues to constrain growth in the tradable sector. We expect a further significant depreciation. So it's very interesting to see uh, a central bank coming out and actually trying to talk down the value uh, of its currency, um, but they do do that from time to time, and in fact they were quite successful. The, the, uh, the dollar did, New Zealand dollar did sell off quite sharply after the, uh, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand commented. On the other hand, in Sweden, they're, they're, they're trying to, uh, to turn, the, turn things around the other way. Uh, the Swedish Central Bank has cut its main interest rate to zero in an attempt to combat deflation. Uh, the cut of 0.25% was bigger than analysts had expected and led to a fall in the krona against both the dollar and the euro. And that from uh, BBC Business um, earlier in the week. Uh, and a little soundbite here from, uh, from the Wall Street Journal to put that all into context. The Swedish krona sank to a four-year low against the dollar on Tuesday after the country's central bank surprised investors by cutting interest rates to zero in its latest attempt to combat ultra-low inflation. The move underscores the challenge for smaller neighbours of the Euro area, which have seen inflation dragged down by the European Central Bank's easing measures. So it's tough to be um, an EU neighbour and not be in the Euro, uh, particularly when you're uh, an export-led country like Sweden. Um, the risk bank, they're taking an extraordinary measure, but again, people are thinking that maybe that won't be enough for them, and maybe Sweden is, again, keep coming back to this, again, starting to look a little bit like Japan, where... Uh, where you know monetary policy is not enough to uh, to stimulate the economy. And now uh, a last sound, but something that uh, you might want to look at after today's presentation. We touched on um, German hyperinflation a couple of times in in the seminar series so far, uh, not least again on Tuesday. Um, here's a little soundbite from. Uh, from the BBC Radio 4 station. Um, by the end of 1923. Uh, the cost of a German egg was 500,000 million times more than it was in 1918. Um, so a very interesting 15-minute radio show there called Money in Crisis. Uh, look at why my inflation of the, um, and the collapse of a currency through the notes produced at the time. Uh, there's a link there uh, to the show. Have a listen. Um, very interesting perspective. 15 minutes of your day, probably well worth spending it on that. All right, so let's move on to our last slide in this section what the money thinks. Well, for, for today's slide, I've gone quite quite uh, simply uh, to, to a look at what really quantitative easing meant for the markets, and in, in this case for uh, US equities. Uh, one simple chart here, courtesy of Bloomberg.com. Uh, the area, what was bounded by the white line, the blue area under the under there is the Fed balance sheet, and you can see how that grows dramatically from midway through 2008 out to the current level. It's, it's grown tremendously as the Fed printed money to buy assets. Uh, that's this area here, and you can see the, the dramatic jump here, particularly from midway through 2012 to the current levels. This yellow line, the S&P 500, um, sometimes you have to be careful about causation and correlation, but I don't think there's any doubt here that uh, the Fed printing money and buying assets is one of the big you know, factors behind uh, the dramatic rally in uh, US equities across that period. Obviously, that printing has stopped now. The question must be whether that relationship will work uh, as the Fed begins to unwind from the, its actual QE program and rates start to rise. So that's what we're looking forward to in the coming year. OK. All right, on to the meat of today's uh, presentation, the US dollar, its status and relationships. So in our series of webinars so far, We've looked at the factors that drive global effects and other markets, and the influence of things like interest rates, inflation, and economic performance on price formation. But what are the actual nuts and bolts, or components, if you will, of the FX market? Well, clearly, the answer is the individual currencies of sovereign nations. But how does the FX market relate to these currencies, or rather relate these currencies to each other, 24 hours a day, five days a week, 52 weeks per year. Currencies, and it's a little bit of housekeeping really, but it's worth stressing this, currencies are identified by a unique three-letter mnemonic, which is often phonetic, i.e. The, the letters sound quite like the word in English. So for instance, JPY is the Japanese yen, GBP is the symbol for the Great British Pound, and AUD the symbol for the Australian dollar. 
and so on. And the rates between these currencies are expressed with at least with, sorry, rather with two of these symbols beside the price, allowing us to easily identify the rates in question. So if you ever see an FX quote, it should always have the two current country currency symbols beside it to allow you to determine which 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 rate you're actually looking at. Okay, so FX trading falls into two broad categories which are known as pairs and crosses and all currency trades are conducted between two individual currencies and due to the dollar's historical and continuing role as the world's reserve currency, the greenback is the base currency in the majority of FX deals conducted on a daily basis. Put simply, most FX trades involve a view on the performance of another currency against the US dollar and these prices are associated and sorry, these prices and associated trades rather are known as currency pairs. Not all transactions are US dollar based, however. Commerce is global, as we saw in, in earlier uh, slides, and it has been for centuries. Uh, and Japanese households, for instance, may like to buy New Zealand lamb, whilst the Kiwis may have a taste for Wagyu beef. That lovely Yokohama beef where the cows get massaged and they get to drink beer and eat grain all day. Um, the sale of Japanese yen to buy New Zealand dollars and the country trade, the vice versa, to facilitate these trades does not involve the US dollar at all. So if I'm selling Japanese yen to buy New Zealand dollars or selling New Zealand dollars to buy Japanese yen, I'm not getting involved with the US dollar whatsoever. As we can see from the table on the right, um, in April 2013, there was $2.5 billion worth of per day of spot transactions between the yen and the New Zealand dollar. And those stats there from the very, very useful Bank of International Settlements Triennial Survey. Um, and the interaction between two currencies that does not involve the US dollar are known as crosses. Now there's a a mathematical relationship as well at work here between um, crosses and pairs uh, and we can infer uh, the price of uh, a cross such as uh, sterling Japanese yen or GBP Japanese yen from the price of two pairs, in this case uh, GBP versus US dollar or cable as it's known and dollar yen and we simply multiply and if you look at our table to the right you'll see how this is done, we simply multiply the cable rate by the dollar yen rate to achieve an implied rate for our uh, sterling yen, and as you can see, we've multiplied 108.036 by 1.612 to give us 174.15, which is pretty close to the 174.159 rate that was actually prevailing in our table at the time. So, so those uh, mathematical relationships exist between crosses and pairs that involve the, the, the underlying currencies within the cross. The primacy of the dollar. Well, the dollar is, is. We talked about special relationships in the title of the slide. The dollar is the, is, you know, is the golden boy of the of the currency world. <clears throat> it's the most widely traded currency on the planet. And the table on the right shows FX trading data during April 2013. Once again, we've looked at uh, the sort of the Bible really for FX stats. This Bank of International Settlements uh, Triennial Survey. And we can see that uh, the US dollar was involved in 87% of the total transactions. And that figure here is this $4.652 trillion figure there. So 87% of the total transactions in the survey period uh, involved the US dollar. And in all categories during this period, the dollar's volume was at least twice as large as any of its peers. And in fact, we can see that even if we combine the turnover for turnover figures for the euro, Great British Pound and the Yen, we still fall short of the total dollar figure. So that what I've done here is inserted my own little level, uh, Euro, GBP and Yen turnover figures all aggregated, so we come to a figure of just under $3.65 trillion, still well short of the, uh, of the total dollar transaction value in that month. Although we come closest, uh, as I say here, in spot transactions, uh, which is the next uh, column over, where the total figure for spot transactions was 1.59 trillion for the combined euro, pound and yen, and in the dollar, uh, we did 1.69 trillion dollars. So the dollar, you know, has primacy. It is the uh, it is the the top dog, if you will, on the currency street. 
and there's a simple reason for this and that is is, is because of its role as the world's reserve currency. Now, you can define a, a reserve currency as follows. A reserve currency or anchor currency is a currency that is held in significant quantities by governments and institutions as parts of their foreign exchange reserves and one that is commonly used in international transactions. And the role of reserve currency has previously been played historically by the Dutch Guilda the British pound sterling, but effectively since the end of World War One, and if, and if we're truthful, we'll probably even slightly before that, the US dollar has assumed this role. And according to data from the European Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund, as of the end of Q2 2014, so to, at the end of June, just over 60% of the world's foreign currency reserves were held in US dollars. Now, notably, there were 24% of those reserves also held in euros. So the euro comes, uh, you know, a, a relatively close second to uh, to the US dollar in terms of uh, reserve currencies held by government institutions and others. But the reserve currency, and consequently the dollar, uh, enjoys what is known as the exorbitant privilege. That was. Uh, a phrase coined by the French, but what they mean there is it gets it gets things its own way. And for instance, global commodities are priced in US dollars so that the USA does not suffer currency swings in the pricing of those commodities. And it, you know, other things include the fact that uh, the reserve currency is unlikely to suffer a balance of payments crisis. But there are some um, some cons as well as pros, and the truth is that being the dominant force in world trade, the reserve currency faces a political economic and moral burden and we think you know of America's role as the world's policeman um, and that's largely due to the fact that it is the world's um, reserve dollar is the world's reserve currency it is the world's you know dominant superpower so what qualities should or must a reserve currency really have well the reserve currency must have the confidence and trust of its users it's no good you know having a currency that, that of this level that people can't believe and they must believe that uh, that uh, you know the, the reserve currency is a solid tangible thing a, a, a good bet that they can rely on it must engender the belief that the host nation will honor its debts and manage its economy in a way that safeguards the value of that currency so you know as a store of value you've got to believe that the people that run the, the country that has the reserve currency, in this case the United States of America, are going to manage the economy in a sensible way and safeguard the value of that currency. But it also must be freely accessible, acceptable to all parties and highly liquid, yet be considered scarce enough to retain its value in the mind of its users. And just think about that, a, a currency has a value, money has a value in the mind of, you know, in, in our eyes as, as consumers and people who spend currency because it's not easy to come by. It's got scarcity value and, and yet at the same time we need to have ready access to, to a currency and it needs to be freely accessible all around the world. So there's something of a contradiction there but as long as people believe that uh, the dollar is uh, a valuable item to hold it will, it will in the, for at least the foreseeable future be the reserve currency. However, let's just have a look at a few stats about uh, about uh, the you know the currency in the American economy generally. Um, if we look at um, the money supply and M2 is a measure of money money growth, uh, which covers cash and near cash, um, that grows 40 fold between January 1959 from a figure of 286 billion dollars to 11 trillion 351. Uh, billion dollars in June 2014, so a 40-fold rise in, in cash and near cash in the USA. Some of that's obviously represented by you know economic growth in the US, but nonetheless, that's quite a substantial monetary growth. Some other figures which might make you question, uh, you know, the, the dollar's uh, supremacy. Uh, US national debt stands at some 17.9 trillion dollars, and is rising by a frightening 2.4 billion dollars per day. Um, but because the world loves the dollar, they don't have any problem funding that debt. Um, speaking of, uh, of liabilities, total outstanding US dollar liabilities as of the September the 18th, and these figures are taken from the Federal Reserve's uh, own database, uh, those liabilities 
uh, totaled $147.9 trillion. Um, that is a substantial sum of money in anyone's language, um, but again, because people believe in the value of the dollar, uh, that doesn't seem to scare them. Of course, that figure there only shows one side of the of the, uh, of the balance sheet. We're not we haven't discussed what you know the actual total assets based in U.S. dollar terms are. Nonetheless, 147.9 trillion dollars are you know the the outstanding liabilities of, you know in U.S. dollars in the United States as we speak. Well, we talked about, or, or title, the title slide talked about special relationships, and one of the most uh, obvious special relationships between the dollar and the world at large is the relationship between the US dollar and commodities. Um, as we saw earlier, the global reserve currency enjoys benefits that others don't, this so-called uh, privilege, exorbitant privilege. Uh, the international trade has, for much of the last hundred years, been priced in US dollars, which has obviously been a massive benefit to the US, and in particular, the trade in commodities is dollar-based, which is probably, uh, you know, the biggest benefit they gain from being the world's reserve currency. Because of this, the US is not subject to the external currency factors that affect the price of commodities for other consumers. It doesn't really matter to them um, what happens to the price in terms of other currencies as far as commodities are concerned, because they're always buying in dollars. Um, and it's not uh, affecting the price they pay. And in fact, the USA enjoys additional privileges because of the dollar's influence on commodities. And this is a very straightforward relationship. A strong US dollar means lower commodity prices. What conversely, of course, a weak US dollar tends to imply higher commodity prices. But the chart on the right, I think, exemplifies this quite nicely. Uh, here we've plotted the FTSE 350 mining index, which is a nice proxy for uh, for many of the world's commodities against the dollar index, and we plotted it uh, since the late parts of 2012 into early 2013, right out to the current day. And you'll see two clear, clear points where the dollar index, the green line, rallies sharply, and at the same time, the uh, blue line, the FTSE 350 mining index, i.e., commodities and commodity related stocks, sell off sharply. And this is repeated here again uh, in September. Uh, 2014. So that relationship cast in stone, a strong dollar means lower commodity prices, a weaker dollar tends to imply uh, higher commodity prices. Okay. So is the dollar always going to be um, the world's reserve currency? Well, as we have learned already, several currencies have played the role uh, of global, global reserve currency in recent history, and it may be that within our lifetimes we see a further change, if you will, a new top dog. When the single European currency or euro was introduced in January 1999, it was seen as a possible, indeed probable, successor to the US dollar. It is used daily by some 334 million people and has a physical currency in circulation of just under 1 trillion euros. So, you know, it is a a substantial player in the world's currency markets in its own right. However, even midway through the second decade, it, the one-size-fits-all philosophy, combined with a lack of fiscal conformity within the EU and rule by committee, added to the effects of the financial crisis and credit crunch, that have prevented uh, the euro from assuming the role of heir apparent to the dollar. And, and until really the problems within the eurozone are sorted out, that's not likely to happen. Just as an anecdote, uh, my friends who've studied history and studied these things tell me that uh, the dollar took a hundred years to bed in uh, across the United States. So we're only, you know, 15, 16 years through uh, this, you know, Euro experiment. Um, some way to go before, perhaps if, if that's the right time scale, before the Euro is in a role to challenge um, the dollar for supremacy. What another contender uh, for the role of uh, global reserve currency is the Chinese Yuan. Uh, the growth in China's economic power over the last 20 years and its importance as the engine of global manufacturing trade have propelled the UN into, con into contention. But a lack of convertibility in liquidity, and it's not a fully convertible currency by any means, trades in bands and is tightly controlled uh, by the uh, Bank of China. Uh, the, uh, the lack of convertibility, the liquidity, and the question marks over the stability of an economy that is still controlled from the centre by what is at least still in, in name a communist government uh, are all major hurdles 
uh, for the UN to overcome. However, you know, if we look at uh, this comment here from CNBC back in February, a survey of 200 institutional investors, 100 headquartered in mainland China and 100 outside of it, published by State Street and The Economist, found that 53% of investors think the renminbi, brackets the yuan, will surpass the US dollar as the world's major reserve currency. So people think it's going to happen, um, maybe not right now. Some work to do there for China. Sorry, let me just go back to a previous slide. So are there any other potential um, solutions? Well, there might be what's called a supranational solution, or one that uh, that uh, uh, comes with beyond the boundaries, if you like, of individual states. Um, so as we saw in our early webinars, as World War II came to a close, the Allied powers met at Bretton Woods to plan the post-war global economic financial system. In doing so, they created institutions such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which are still with us today. Now, the IMF has become the backstop for failing and developing economies and a neutral promoter of international monetary cooperation and exchange rate stability, which facilitates the balanced growth of international trade. That's an, a nice little mission statement there from the IMF website. But in its role as the central banker's bank and the lender of last result, last resort rather, it has created its own quasi-currency, the SDR or special drawing right. Now this SDR is an international reserve asset, it's created by the International Monetary Fund in 1969 to supplement member countries' official reserve, and its value is based on a basket of four international currencies, um, and which and these special drawing rights can be exchanged for freely usable currencies. So it's a you know an interbank, intercountry currency, if you will. But some economists and bankers have suggested that SDRs or something similar could one day fulfil the role of a global reserve currency, and that's probably not a bad idea overall. But given you know, the political ramifications of this and the, and the likelihood of trying to get countries such as China and the US to agree to that with all their own vested interest. That's not likely to happen anytime soon, but it couldn't be ruled out completely in the future. So there we are. Once again, we've, uh, we've looked briefly at a subject that we could, uh, we could spend a lot of time on uh, you know, on each of these slides and dig down into, into greater depth, but I hope that that's given you a flavour of, uh, of what the dollar is, that why, why it occupies the, the position it does, what the role of the reserve currency is, and uh, why that's so important, and what the future may hold uh, for, for both the dollar and for the role of global reserve currency. And with that, I think I've probably taken up uh, enough of your time as we're coming up to half eleven. So, Clive, if uh, if you'd like to uh, take up the baton, I shall hand over to you, sir. Hi, Darren. Thank you very much indeed. Um, interesting little anecdote, actually. I was um, doing a training seminar last night up in London for a, um, a bunch of uh, metals brokers, and uh, it started at six o'clock. Uh, of course, six o'clock was um, exactly when the Fed uh, <laughs> announcement came out. So they were rather distracted because the prices of uh, zinc and nickel and all these things that they were following suddenly started moving very dramatically. And I did. I was thinking of asking them before we started. I was, I was saying, you know, does will the Federal Reserve affect, you know, the, the price of these metals? And I was. And I didn't even. Th I didn't really think it through. Of course it does, because they're priced in U.S. dollars. <laughs> so the price, you know, obviously, you know, you talked about that relationship between commodities and um, and and and, uh, the, and the U.S. dollar, and, and and yeah, that's that was sort of living proof of that. Um, there are a few other <coughs> apologies for the coughing. Hang on, should have a sip of water. I think. Try and sort that out. There are a few interesting um, currency pairs that, um, that that you know that. that, that relationships as well that people look at. Uh, I've quite often heard people talk about the Australian dollar, or the Aussie dollar against the US dollar being a bit of a proxy for gold. And another one I hear is that um, US dollar, uh, the, the dollar CAD, US, uh, US dollar against the Canadian dollar is a good proxy for, or a reverse proxy for oil prices. And um, you know, that, that, that we can see some evidence of that. And I'm going to actually show some charts of that um, 
later on. Um, so you know, during during my talk. So yes, right. I think I've just done some rambling there, haven't I? Let's try and get a screen up so you guys can see what I'm looking at. Okay. So um, if someone could just confirm for me that um, that you can see my front page slides, part two. Can everyone see that? Okay. Hello. There you are. Okay, well I'll assume you can. Um, right, uh, so I talked about candlesticks um, last time around and uh, I'm going to stick to that subject again uh, for this one. It's one of the things that I really like looking at more than uh, anything. It's my sort of, um, what's the word, it's, it, it's, it's my uh, it, the, the basis of all my analysis. It's the, it's the starting point if you like. Um, and I think where we got to, we'd, we'd we looked at the hammer candlestick in particular uh, on, our, on the last webinar. Uh, it is one of the most powerful patterns, in it, and I think it's always useful to try and um, to, to sort of you know, use one pattern to try and get um, get into the basics of these kind of things, and then um, and then you can you can crack on from there. So um, I don't think I actually got through all the slides I wanted to. So let's do that. Let's have a refresher now. The hammer is a candlestick with a small real body. That real body is at the upper end of the um, of the day's range, which gives us a long lower shadow. And I think we did we uh, I did this slide as well, which was showing the idea that that long lower shadow is the result of a market actually selling off significantly and then coming all the way back again. So if you see that during a falling market. The, um, the the idea is maybe the sellers have, have gone away and the buyers are actually now coming, stepping in and dominating trade, uh, and and you see whether the, that uh, yeah whether that's confirmed with um, subsequent candlesticks. Um, I think we did that one. I'll move on from that slide. And again, we saw you know I think I showed this slide previously where we saw these hammer candlestick patterns, uh, and this. This one was particularly interesting because that was when the market hit a psychological round number um, level, and round numbers do have a say in um, in FX markets. You quite often see markets um, gravitating towards or finding support or resistance um, at round numbers, and some, I mean, there's there's various reasons for that. Possibly, you know, arguably just a psychological thing, but you could also argue that it's um, got something to do with option um, option expires and stuff like. That. I'm sure that Darren would want to get into that kind of thing in later webinars. Um, now I want to show you this chart, and I don't think I got round to this one on our last um, on the last webinar. This is a very old chart. I use this for all my all the courses I've, I um, that I that I present on candlesticks and have done forever. And I like this chart particularly um, because it illustrates something very important. Now you might sitting there at the moment thinking, hang on a minute, he's showing us a chart from 15 years ago. And, you know, do these things not come along very often? <laughs> um, it's not actually the case. It's kind of the opposite with this one. Weekly chart for euro against US dollar. And you can see here we had a hammer candlestick. And that was the lower that move and subsequently pushed higher. Here we had another hammer candlestick and the market subsequently pushed higher. So you could argue and you could say, well, these are bloody, these are these are great. These things they really work well. You know, I, I definitely want to be just um, looking out for um, candlestick for these hammer candlestick patterns, and I want to be buying the market. And um, whenever I see them, okay, well that idea works well until you actually look at um, the. the you look at the um, further further back on that chart. If you go back to here, okay, we've got two candlesticks right here that are also hammer candlesticks. We've got the small real body and the long lower shadow, and um, arguably both of those. You know, we're in a falling market, so that's ticking all the boxes of our set of rules for what a hammer is. And um, well, you know, what happened? They didn't work. They didn't actually do a job for us at all because the next candlestick was a large red, and you know the market sold off further, and it just didn't work. Didn't work, okay? And obviously that's why I am sitting here talking to you about these today, rather than sitting on my yacht in the Bahamas sipping, um, you know, sipping um, I don't know, sipping cocktails and just enjoying the high life, um, <laughs> because they don't work all the time, and you have to sort of mitigate against that, and you have to have a plan, and you have to use other things, and you and um, you know, it's not, it's not, it's just not as easy as that, basically. Um, but you know, 
looking at this particular slide, and I usually spend a bit of time on this when I'm doing seminars and things like you know, like that, you know, the sort of thing we're doing today. If you look at that particular instance, you could say, just looking at what we've got on that chart, let's say we we we, we want a reason. Okay, we want to sweep. We've seen the hammer candlestick. Now, um, you know, what's what do we need? we need? We need something else to say. Yeah, that is a good one, or no, that is a bad one. Okay, so something that will say yes, we want to get involved with this one here and this one here, but we don't want to get involved with these with these ones here. And quite simply, using the data we've got sitting on that chart, we could argue. We could arguably say, well, and you know, I often throw this out. So if I'm in a sort of classroom situation, I say to the people in front of me, you know, what can we do? What can we say? And um, yeah, the, the, I usually get somebody that comes up with the idea of looking for a green candlestick afterwards, i.e., looking for the next candlestick to confirm that the market is indeed travelling higher. So let's do that with what we've got in front of us on that particular. Um, slide and we'll start with this one okay there's a hammer so we're on alert we have you know we've got an alert basically that says this could be worth buying okay let's wait and it's a weekly chart so we're waiting a week you know you can you can apply these to any time frames in this particular instance it's a one week time frame and the market rallies um, the next week and so if we if we were to buy it the next week and then we're buying it here and sure enough, we get a good trade. The market, um, you know, the market rallies significantly, and everybody, you know, and you, and you make money on that trade. Let's go to this one. Okay, market rallies. Yep. Okay, let's buy it. Well, unfortunately, it didn't work on that occasion because we had three red candles and gave back all of the gains from that week after that. So that particular instance didn't really work out. We would have lost a small amount of money there. Here, we see our two hammers that are together. Okay, we see this first hammer, we say, all right, prove it to me. Go up. And we don't. The next week we post, we, 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 we stay below, you know, we, we, we just post another hammer. But we've got two in a row now. That's even more interesting, um, arguably, that well, there's two hammers in a row. So we're saying, okay, well, you know, go up, prove it to me. Once again, you're asking the same question after, the, after this um, second candle. And the answer is given to us, and it's given to us in the negative, no. The market did not go up, and we did not. Um, we didn't. So we never triggered a signal there. And now that's an interesting thing, and that's an important thing to sort of think about. Um, one of the, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I, I almost seem to be doing a, a book, a um, a book a, per seminar where I suggest a book that you should uh, go out and buy or read. And uh, the one I'd suggest to you this week, uh, for uh, today is um, Jack Schrager, um, and it's called um, Market Wizards. It's a great book. I'm sure, um, I'm sure Darren and, and Misha have read that, um, that book, um, and I hope that uh, some, you know, our listeners have as well. It is well worthwhile. One of the things that that book says is, um, is you know, and as I say, it's interviews with top traders, and a lot of these top traders say it's very important to make sure you don't lose money, <laughs> and then you can start worrying about making money. If you're trading, okay, and uh, I think that's an extremely important and extremely relevant sort of uh, thing. It seems to be for me reading that book. It's always a common theme throughout that book, um, and and I think that's relevant to what we've got here. We've got the uh, with our with our second piece of um, confirm. You know, we're asking for that confirmation. We managed not to lose money on this particular occasion because we never triggered the trade. And you know there is an old phrase in the markets that sometimes the best trade is no trade at all. Wait for the setups, wait for the confirmation, and then enter the trade. Um, and I think that's very important. Um, I think I'm rambling a bit. Let's try and move on a little bit. There was another. I, you know, we, we may uh, in later seminars get on to uh, in momentum studies and things like that. And I've had. There's the same chart with another window opened up near the bottom, and that actually was as uh, was an extra piece of you know, another layer of confirmation that said to me at that time that there was no you know, there was no reason to buy these ones, but there was um, a bit more you know these had a bit more of an interesting story about them. What's the um, okay? So that's the hammer, and um, I, you know, and I think it's uh, been a worthwhile exercise to spend a little bit of time on that. Um, there are. A lot of other candlestick patterns. There's a lot of patterns that um, that you can look for, and um, we can, you know we can start going through those during these webinars. And the one I'll look at today, focus on today, um, is called a shooting star. 
A shooting star is, quite simply, and there's our set of rules there on the screen, it's a candlestick with a small real body. It's a candlestick with a real body that's at the bottom end of the candle with little or no lower shadow. And um, the, that, that will leave us with a, with a long upper shadow, which should be at least twice the length of the real body. Does this sound familiar? This might sound familiar. This is kind of the same set of rules as the hammer, but everything's sort of in reverse. With a hammer, we're looking for a long lower shadow. With a shooting star, we're looking for a long upper shadow. And actually, a shooting star is a reversal pattern in a rising market. So if we see this kind of candlestick in a market that's going up, then we are on alert, if you like, that uh, the market may have actually just topped out and may be starting. Yeah, we, we might start to see that dropping. So it's almost, it, 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 well, not almost, it is exactly everything that the hammer is but turned on its head. And there's a couple of examples of shooting star uh, patterns um, on a chart, and again, um, we, we can see that this. Uh, yeah, so so we've got it. We've got a rally here. We're making higher highs and higher lows. The market's heading higher, and then suddenly we get this day where the market. You know, and if you think about that candlestick, what are the components of it? Open, high, low, close. Uh, we opened at uh, this price. We went up to here, and then came down to here and closed just below the open. Uh, that's what we have to do to give us that shape of candlestick. Sold off the next day, tried to go up the day after that, and then we have another day, only three or four days after this, um, after our shooting star, where we've got, yeah, the same thing happens. We we open here on this occasion, go all the way up to here, and then come all the way back and close. Actually, on this occasion, just above the open, but yeah, don't worry about the colour of the real body on a shooting star. Really, the uh, the key message is that upper shadow, because that upper shadow is that. You know, is the thing that's telling you that the market has rejected the upside, if you like. Um, so that is what a shooting star looks like, and um, we can we can sort of translate that, if you like, um, onto the you know, as we did with the hammer. Um, that's yeah, done that bit, done that bit, done that bit. Um, we we can say that. And we can look at this chart, which is a 15-minute candlestick chart. And so every candle on there is 15 minutes worth of price action, and that is a shooting star day, but sort of zoomed in on, if you like. And that shows us that on this particular day, the market headed higher, got to a certain, um, you know, got to got to a price level up here at 7.32, and then we started to see uh, the sellers appearing, and the sellers gave us a very low close. Okay, they won the day. Arguably, you could say that um, the buyers, the bulls, the people who were sitting on long longs, were, were very happy with themselves when the market was up here. Uh, if you were short with the market at this time and stayed on, stayed short, then you are, you know, it's it's nasty business. You're not doing very well. But the sellers are attracted by these higher prices and the market pushes down and we close near the lows for that day. So the bulls, the buyers, go home thinking, well, hang on a minute, I, had a, I was sitting on a really nice profit earlier this morning and um, now I'm not. I don't really, you know, what happened there? And so they'll start to doubt whether being long or being, uh, you know, or it is a good idea or whether they should be thinking about covering those positions, etc., etc. Hopefully you can sort of get a skew and get an idea of the, um, of the, of the psychology, as I like to call it, of the market and the interplay between buyers and sellers when you are at these particular, um, uh, you know, when you're forming these, these sort of patterns. So we closed low on that day. The sellers went home happier for the first time in a while because we were in a rising market. So the sellers went home happier than they have done in a while. Um, the interesting thing about that particular shooting star, and I can show you this chart, that particular shooting star occurred, and this is actually now I've squashed it, I've gone to a, a very long time frame, this is a quarterly chart for gold, um, and I can tell you that that shooting star was, that, was when we hit that level there right there at 7.29 sometime in 2006. And I was keeping an eye on that level anyway because actually I had gone all the way back to 1980 and 1981, the last time we traded at those prices. And that showed to me on the chart, you know, you just for me, you go back as far back as you need to go to find the last time we were trading at those prices. And that said to me that 7.29 was an important um, price level to watch as was 8.75, there's a story behind this rise here, but we managed to save that for another day. And, you know, so um, 
Oh, sorry. So that particular day, uh, right? The, let me get back to the chart. Sorry, about this. That day there was the day that the market hit that price from 25 years earlier, and that, um, you know, this was the reaction. And um, you know, I, I actually like looking at this intraday chart, and, and uh, when we're doing this, the, this exercise of thinking about, you know, the market as a battle between the bulls and the bears, the buyers and the sellers. If you think about this, there's a steady, solid. You know, this was actually the Asian and so and, and the first part of the European um, trade because this is a market that's open, you know, pretty much 24 hours a day, and so we just crabbed higher, nice and steadily, nice and happily for that uh, entire period. Then we posted this um, doji candlestick here and another doji here, and then the battle started. The sellers pushed us all the way down here. The buyers went, no, you don't, push it back here. The sellers reacted. The buyers tried to react. The sellers reacted again. The sellers kept pushing the market lower and lower and lower, and they really should. They re really would have been quite happy uh, with what they achieved on that day, on that basis. They won that battle of the, uh, yeah, that afternoon to and fro, if you like. Um, this chart here is the 2013 high for the FTSE index, and you can see from that particular chart that uh, we did indeed post a shooting star on the day we made last year's high, and if we again go to the smaller time frames, uh, the intraday time frames that uh, the day traders would use and that, that uh, short term traders would reference, here's a 10 minute bar chart, that, does, you know, that, that kind of gives us uh, an idea of the, the, of the direction of travel, but this 60 minute candlestick chart here, so that's every candlestick's one hour on that chart, shows a, a, there was actually a shooting star on the hourly, on the shorter term time frames. And I do believe if you're looking at markets and looking at, um, you know, looking at trading markets, particularly day trading, you need to have a couple of different time frames that you're referencing. Uh, but always with um, the, bigger, the, lo the, bigger pit, the bigger time frames in mind, because they can give you the context of, um, of where you're at. Now, talking of shooting stars, in the FTSE, we are obviously seeing today uh, a bit of a sell-off in the FTSE. The market has, uh, I'm not completely surprised by this to be honest, and uh, that, that, that we've sort of had this, oh, QE's finished. Uh, that means the Fed won't be buying every single day. Hmm, uh, that means that if the biggest buyer that, you know, that arguably the biggest buyer we've seen in the market for a long time. And Darren, you can tell me if I'm wrong on this, but I, still, I do feel that this is you know, something that, that is significant. We used to have a very big buyer every single day, the Federal Reserve, uh, of bonds, but that money's filtered through to equities. Um, and they basically, they've stopped doing that from yesterday. Clive, Oops, that, that was exactly uh, the point. <laughs> well, that was exactly the point I was trying to make with that slide. Um, mm. What the money thinks, you know, that there was a, a very clear symbiotic relationship. If you, you know, one that you know, equities were in lockstep in the U.S. with the, you know, the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet and their buying of, of assets. Now that's now that's come to an end. All right, they're not saying they're going to sell. Um, the things they bought, but at the same time, they're not going to be adding to it. And if you take the biggest buyer out of the market, you you, you can't do that without um, without some kind of consequences. So yeah, I um, wouldn't have thought so exactly. And I do think that it's going to be an interesting month, if you like, with respect to a lot of the, you know asset prices for um, bonds and equities. Um, you know, so we, we will see how that pans out. Um, but we've already, you know, this morning in European trade on the equity side, at least seen. Uh, evidence of, of sellers reappearing sort of thing. Um, getting back to talking about shooting stars, um, this particular chart, let's just get rid of the profile stuff because that's just going to confuse you. This particular chart shows the um, the highs. Um, that, uh, what have I done here? Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Um, this was the high this year on the 4th of September. And it's only a small example, but that is a shooting star. Uh, what's probably a slightly better example of the shooting star is, um, and let's see if I can get it on a scale that shows it nicely. No, I'm having a nightmare here. Um, pressing the wrong buttons, people. Sorry about that. Is this one here? Okay, the 19th of September, the market made another attempt to go higher on that day, didn't get to that uh, high from there, and came off and sold off, and then we started selling off the next day, and that was pretty much the, uh, you know, that triggered this move right down to here. Um, we have rallied since, and now we're starting to see a sell-off again. 
Um, recent examples of shooting star uh, patterns. Dollar CAD. US dollar against Canadian dollar. And you can see when we hit the recent highs there, um, that you could argue is a shooting star. The one next to it is most definitely a shooting star. And um, so that suggested that there was we'd seen some um, some rejection of the upside on those particular days. And that was an interesting one because actually you know, I'm showing you the daily chart there. If we were to move to a weekly time frame, I think I've got a better weekly chart than that one. Um, yeah, weekly time frame, we can see that actually that that that's so this is the same but on the weekly. Um, and we actually got above um, the, high, the March high at 112.80 for that particular currency pair. And we got all the way up to 13.86, so we rode 100 pips through this resistance level. Um, but if we look on the daily, we very quickly gave that back. This is 12.80, that's that line, that's that March high. You know, we, 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 we really struggled um, to, to, to make any headway above that particular level on those days, and then the market started to sell off again. Um, Let's just cover something we were talking about: currency markets, and then we were talking uh, and uh, commodity markets. Um, let's just try and do something here quickly. I should have prepared this probably, but I didn't. Um, here is um, light sweet crude. Bre uh, um, this is the the West Texas Intimate uh, Intimate WTI. <laughs> okay, light light crude, and you can see that actually. The 15th of October was the day the dollar, the uh, dollar CAD topped out, and the 16th of October, the next day, was when the light sweet crude actually. That was the last, you know, that's the last, uh, that, that's the low at the moment for this particular move. So I think you can see just from what, I, and I think I've got them on the same scale. You can see how there's a relationship there, and as I say, there are people that look at these sort of relationships all the time and sort of look for interplays between them. Um, did I have another one? Right, well, yes, this is an interest. This is something I wouldn't mind sharing, uh, and I'm sure we've got time. Shooting stars, hammers are candlestick patterns that you can really apply to any time frame. Um, and we've got uh, an example here this morning in the Australian dollar. Uh, the Australian dollar has um, uh, we saw a significant sell-off on the Fed yesterday, and we have crabbed a little bit lower since. There's a little shooting star candlestick, which was at 5.30. Uh, sorry, there's a hammer candlestick at 5.30 this morning um, when the market made its low there. Uh, we have rallied since then, not significantly, uh, and our first resistance level would have been here at 88.09. The market got to 88.07. And this is a 30-minute chart, okay? So every single candlestick on this chart is half an hour's worth of price action. There is our first resistance because that was the uh, the highest point we reached after the big sell-off on the Fed. We got to the to within two pips of that and posted this um, shooting star candlestick on the 30-minute time frame. I've actually shorted Aussie dollar on the back of that, so I am small on side at the moment. I shorted the market when we broke below the low of the shooting star, believing that we can see weakness back to here. It's not a long-term trade, but I will. I'm happy to sit on that and take some back around here, uh, where, where you know around these this sort of support area around here, uh, and then maybe try and run some in case this is a sort of consolidation, and then the market sort of decides to to sort of break a bit lower from there. So that hopefully gives you a little bit of insight on using candlesticks, using candlesticks on different time frames as well, and looking for um, these patterns at support and resistance levels um, to give you, uh, in particular at support resistance levels, um, to give you an indication of, um, of, of any changes in mood in the market. Um, I think that is probably me done. Darren, have you got any um, anything else you wanted to um, possibly add at this time, or or, or Mihail, well, or any other guys? Let me just say one thing. I think you know we talked about the relationship between the dollar and the price of commodities, and that big sell-off in the Aussie, which is obviously a totally commodity-related currency, just you yeah. know, exemplifies that, doesn't it? You know, a stronger dollar because you think rates are going up in the U.S. That's negative. 
uh, for commodity prices, which is rare because the economy earns a load of its money, and you, you know you can Indeed, clearly see yeah, that, selling that iron interplay. Off China, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so you can clearly see that interplay um, work there, and it's nice, you know, when you when you cover something in a in a seminar to be able to to draw a real world example. You know, it's right on the money in real time, as it were. Um, it is, yeah. And one of the other things that encourages me that we could be seeing further weakness in the Aussie dollar is its relationship with gold, uh, according to some people. And I've now put a thirty-minute chart up for gold, and um, I haven't quite got the um, I haven't quite got the scales the same, but it's because. Um, it's something like that. Okay, you can see again, gold sold off on the Federal Reserve last night, and has since uh, you know had another sell-off. Uh, that was at 5:30 this morning. We started another sell-off this morning. Um, all right, the Aussie actually rallied during that period, but <laughs> um, we can see exactly that relationship sort of going on there, if you like. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, certainly, as far as um, what I've got to say, um, I'm done. Thank you very much to everyone for listening um, and hopefully you'll come back and we'll see you again next time. Look forward to it. Thanks yeah. very much everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye bye.